Luke chapter number 16. I'll be honest, I struggled all week with what to preach tonight. And um, I didn't want to preach out of this passage because our pastor has preached out of here before. We've all preached out of here before, probably preachers tonight. And then he mentioned this portion of scripture this morning, and I told myself, it's like, yep, that's it, I'm not going to be there. And then by the time he got to the end of service, God told me, yep, that's where you need to be. So Luke chapter number 16, I do want to thank Pastor for our opportunity to have tag team tonight. We're going to start reading down in verse number 19. So there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of swords and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember thou that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from you from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. I want to look at a few things first off by, in talking about hell. Can I say that the first thing we see is that hell is immediate. It talked about right there, verse 22 to 23, and it says, The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments. Hell is immediate. When you pass out of this life and pass into eternity, you're going to heaven or hell. You're going to one or the other. Nobody's praying for you. They're not trying to get you in someplace else. Nobody's going to give any money. It is immediate to be be absent from this, from be uh, gone out of this world is to be going somewhere into eternity. Not only do we see it's immediate, we also see that it's intense. It said in verse 23, and he, in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment. Didn't say he lifted up his eyes having a good time. Said he wasn't in a little bit of pain. He was in torments, plural, with an S. And we won't take the time to go through and read all the torments that we could find that Scripture tells us that this man was going through. So not only do we know it's intense, but we see the inferno that it talked about in verse number 24. He's begging, we know he's begging for Abraham to allow Lazarus to come and dip his finger and just cool the tip of his tongue because it says, I am tormented in this flame. So we see it's immediate, we know it's intense, and we see that there's an inferno, and it's also inescapable. He tells him then the next verse, as we know in verse 26, Beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which could pass from you cannot, neither can they pass us. So he knows he's there forever. He cannot get away. Brother Josh, why would you come to tag team on a Sunday night and preach to us about hell? Our pastor has preached on the reality of hell. We all heard that message. Hopefully, maybe we've listened to it more than once. So what I want to ask you to this tonight, church, do you believe in that reality of hell? Do you truly believe in that reality of hell? I want to ask you a question tonight. Uh, you, you can go through little Christian calisthenics here and raise your hand. How many of you have ever sent a text message to anybody? Maybe you've gone out someplace and, and maybe you was driving to work and the, uh, the road was slick and it was snow or maybe it was foggy or whatever it may be and you've called back home or you've sent a text message to somebody and said, hey, it's kind of nasty out here. Make sure you be careful. Yeah. Anybody ever sent those? Sure. Anybody ever called and just somebody, maybe you have a, a, a child that's leaving the house or they're just going to work or going on vacation by themselves for the first time and you tell them, you say, hey, just be careful. Right, right. We, we've all sent those texts before because we care about them. Right. And the simple thing is, is that when they go out, we don't want anything bad to happen to them. But for the most part, the worst thing that could happen is they could be in an accident, Brother Phil. Cars are replaceable. They absolutely, they could be hurt. But we care about them. We care enough that we are going to go out of our way to try to make sure that, to let them know, hey, be careful. Just pay attention to things because we want to make sure that you get back here. Yeah. How many of us know somebody that's lost? Sure. Sure. When was the last time you warned them about hell? When was the last time that we warned them about what they are facing in eternity? When was the last time we truly sought them out and looked at them and said, hey, do you have any idea where you're going to spend eternity when you leave here? When was the last time we did that? Can I, I, I grabbed one of these. I wanted to ask this question uh, uh, to somebody else earlier today. 
So you know we have these little tracks that are laying back there. And we, we, we know that we've had a couple of them, a few of them returned. I ordered these. On the most part, I order, I would guess, around 1,000 to usually 2,000 of these each time I order. Maybe twice a year, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Usually twice a year. So about every six months. Do you realize if 50 of us, just 50 of us, not all of us, we could even exclude the kids and even just 50 of us, it passed out 10 of these a week. That's 2,000 a month, Brother Brian. I'd have to order 2,000 every month. I mean, that I have to order probably 10,000 or so every three or four months. And now I'm ordering like 2,000 every six. So when we come up with our excuses on why we can't tell anybody, oh, I'm just, I get too nervous around people. I don't know all the right scripture to tell them. I don't know this, I don't know that. And we come up with excuses. How do you think those excuses are going to fly when we stand before the Lord? They're not going to fly. So I ask you again, do you believe in the reality of hell? Because if we want to answer yes to that, the next question becomes a whole lot harder to answer. Do we just not care? Do we, do we truly just not care? Or is it, as our pastor alluded to this morning, are we too comfortable with where we're at? Are we just too comfortable? Hey, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. I'll do my little bit. I'll pray for him. You know, I'll say my little prayer on the altar, or whatever it may be. I can't help but think, over the last month, I believe it's almost every single service that our pastor has preached on a Sunday morning has been geared towards something about salvation. And we get up and we walk out and where's our burden? How much has it broke us that we've not seen anybody saved? Do we believe in the reality of hell? There are people in our family, there are people that we work with, there are people that we come in contact with every day that are going to die and go to hell. But I'm afraid we don't believe in the reality of it. We, we, we might believe it exists, but it seems to be so far out of our mind that when we look at faces, we just don't think about them truly. They could wake up tomorrow in hell if we don't tell them. Thank you, Pastor. Um, 2 Kings, chapter 8, two verses. When you're there, give me a holler. All right, brother, sisters, let's hit this. Then spake Elijah unto the woman whose son, verse 1 and 2, whose son he had restored to life, saying, Arise, go thou and thy household, and sojourn wheresoever thou canst sojourn. For the Lord hath called for a famine, and it shall also come upon the land for seven years. That means it's complete. And the woman, verse 2, and the woman arose, and... Did after the saying of the man of God, and she went with her household and sojourned in the land of the Philistines for seven years. The thing about this is, I'm surprised they still maintain their relationship. I don't, it doesn't talk about the span of it. But a lot of times, people leave here, you don't hear nothing about them no more. And that's a blessing that they still maintain their relationship. The woman is given what? She's given a command to do what? Get out of here. And it talks about sojourn. What's sojourn mean? We're just here temporary. Right. We're here temporary. Yeah. Good night in the morning. I looked at that up. I said, Lord, that's all right, man. We are here. They, if you're a born-again Christian, yeah. you're only here temporary because it's given you a warning twice. That's the revelation. It brings responsibility. When God reveals something, you can't predict the command will happen. What's the command? Where those who are in Christ are supposed to go out there and tell a lost and dying world like the pastor preached this morning, 1 Thessalonians, and what Brother Christian taught and Brother Josh. He preached on hell. He preached on go tell people. And he brought, um, preached this morning on when we see our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Christian's supposed to go out there. The second priority of the command is to move come and, and to move out. The reason is to move. God often gives a command before the reason. This shows the command has more priority than the reason. Third, the providence of the command. It came before the famine. I'm going to tell you something. And the Lord hath called for a famine. The reason why the Lord calls for a famine is because in the Old Testament is to get people's attention. And that's what we're supposed to do. Through um, testifying what God's going to be doing, we don't have long. 
We don't have long because Jesus Christ is coming back to get his church and you want your loved ones to be a part of it. But they just don't seem to get it. They don't get it. And you cry to them, come on, get with it. In her response, she had to go. She had to go to another land. You think she wanted to go? She didn't want to go. She didn't, but she said, well, in verse 2, I'm, I'm going to skip some of it. I'm, she said, Elijah, I don't want to go. Did she say that? She says no. She packs her stuff up, her and her household, and they get out. She does not complain about it at all. Some of us, I can be just as guilty as, I mean, you just, ah, uh, you got to do this, you got to do that. But when you get saved, the thing about it is you got to go to church. I don't get to go. I want to go to church. Three days a week, we got revival. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, you do get tired. Whoopie-doo, who don't get tired? It's going to happen. But one day, there is a payday one day. And to make a long story short, this dear lady, she endured it for seven years. For seven years, she did it, and she never complained about it. And at the end, she was obedient to God. She did what she was supposed to do. And at the end of this, she'll get a good, well done, and good and faithful servant. You're a good soldier for God, and that's what we have to do. Bless the Lamb of God. I'm done. Mark chapter number 5. Amen. And a uh, long time ago, it used to be pretty common that people had a touch of God on them. And uh, we've kind of got away from that. And that's what I want to preach on tonight, getting Jesus to touch us. Look in verse 25, and it says, And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing better but rather grew worse when she had heard of Jesus came in the press behind and touched his garment for she said if I may touch but his clothes I shall be whole and straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up and she left and uh, felt in her body that she had she was healed of that plague and you know in all honesty she knew she needed to touch him yeah. but all reality she wanted him to touch her right. That's what she was really wanting. She wanted to touch him, but she wanted him to touch her. And here's the thing about getting Jesus to touch us. You'll have to pay the cost. She spent everything she had. And the reason why we don't have these people that have a touch of God on them is because they won't separate or we won't separate ourselves to the cause of our Savior. We are half in, we're half out, and there's so many people that just want to, you know, we're blessed to have the congregation that comes, the majority comes back on Sunday night. A lot of churches don't have faithful people like that. They're not interested in coming him back. Why? Because it costs too much. I want to say this. It cost your Savior a lot for you to be able to sit here tonight. For you to go to heaven. It cost him. Didn't cost you nothing. And I want to say this. If you want to have that, uh, they were. I heard the story of Bob, uh, Bob Jones Sr. They said he would walk around the college and they said that old man has lost his mind. Said he just walks around and talks to himself. They said no he ain't talking to himself. He's talking to God. You know why we won't do it? Because it costs us too much. You know, the, uh, another thing that we won't get a touch on our lives is because the conditions got to get worse. Yeah. Did you see what the Bible says? And you know that their condition got worse. I'll guarantee you, the more you try to do for God, the conditions in your life will get worse. But you'll have more help than you've ever had. Why? Because the closer you get to 
Him, the closer He'll get to you. The closer you draw up to Him, He'll draw... You know, you can face anything if Jesus is in the boat with you. You can go through hell itself if Jesus is walking next to you. The problem is, is we get afraid of all of these storms of life. We need a touch from God today and these things like Brother Josh was talking about and these preachers was talking about, we can accomplish that, but we need a touch from heaven. We need God to touch us individually. We need God to touch us as a church as a whole. We need to, I'm going to be honest with you, folks, we need to spend time every day praying for this man right here that God would give him wisdom. God would give him the ability to leave this congregation in the right way. That's one thing we need. Now let me say this, the next thing, we got to come to where Jesus is. Right. Right. She had to go where he was. Right. You know, a lot of people say, I'd like to have help from God. I'd like to get my life straightened up, but they never come to church. Right. This is the place you get. You don't get gas down at the grocery store. Yeah. Right. Right. You get gas at the gas station. Right. You don't get help from God just sitting at home. I know if you're if you're uh, hindered in by you can't do that. If your health bothers you, and you can't. I understand all that, but a lot of people use that as a crutch. Right. They use that as a crutch. Well, I just don't feel like getting out of my pajamas tonight. Well, I I feel sorry for you, but I want to say this: if you ever want God to touch you, if you ever want to see something special in your life, you know what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to get around Him. Yeah. You're not only going to have to get around Him. You're going to have to get around these people here. You need these people. I need these people. These, this, these people here, uh, uh, Brother Phil, they're more, I'm closer to them than I am my family, my blood family. I'm closer to you all than I am to any of my family. That's the truth, amen. you got to get to where he is. She went to where he was. Last of all, you've got to be consistent. She kept moving. When the crowd got thicker, she didn't say, well, man, I can't make it. Uh, we went, Rhonda, she said, I want to go uh, to this restaurant to eat today. The line was all the way out on 18. I said, I ain't going there. Uh, I was not consistent. I wasn't pressing through the crowd. I said, their food ain't worth it for me. But I want to tell you, here's the thing. To get a touch from God on our life, we got to just keep moving forward. We got to press through the crowd. And we got to have the mindset, I, all I've got to do is to touch something that's touching him, and he'll touch me. That's the ultimate goal. Don't, wouldn't you like to have a special, this special relationship in your life? Wouldn't you like to have this relationship where people said, I tell you what, this fella right here, this lady right here, she got God on her. She's got God on her. I want to tell you, you know, I've, heard, I've been told all my life, well, everybody can't have that. That's not true. The reason you don't have it, the reason I don't have it, is I won't persist. I won't move forward. I won't press through the crowd. I won't put up with all the stuff i got to put up with. Doesn't you like to have the touch of God? I know I would, Brother Doug. Malachi chapter number 2. We don't have time to get into all of it. This is what you need to know. Levi, one of the patriarchs, children of Israel. Levi lived before any page of this book was ever penned. Levi was never the high priest of Israel, but God chose his descendants, the Levites, to become priests in the nation of Israel. Malachi chapter number 2 beginning in verse number 6 talking about Levi and why God chose his descendants to be the priest of Israel it says the law of truth was in his mouth and iniquity was not in his lips he walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity verse number 7 for the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth for he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts the descendants of Levi, the Levites in this day and age, in Malachi's day, weren't doing what they were supposed to do. But you go study it out. God said in those three, if you go back to verse number five and read that too, you'll find that there's three reasons that God chose Levi and his descendants in order to be the priest of Israel. The first was wisdom. If you look at verse number seven, the priest's lips should keep knowledge. What happened? He learned at some point what God found acceptable and what God found unacceptable, and that's what he told other people. Okay, but then you'll find in verse number six that there was a walk. It says that he walked with me. Who? With God. Levi walked with God. 
in peace and equity. We don't have time to get into them two words, but you know what it meant? They were partners in bringing other people to righteousness. But not only were there words, not only or wisdom and a walk, there's also words. It says, he walked with me in peace and equity and did turn many away from iniquity. How did he do that? The law of truth was in his mouth. His words turned other people from destruction to life. As I was reading these verses, as I was thinking about it, Levi was a roundabout Christian. Roundabout. Not meaning weird, talking about the roundabout. You can't just drive through a roundabout. You're going to tear up your car. A roundabout requires a decision. You got to make a choice when you come to a roundabout. You got to choose to slow down. You got to choose to wait on other people. You got to choose to pay attention. Or else the roundabout's going to destroy you. You know what I've heard a lot of tonight? We need more roundabout Christians. You want to know what Levi's life was? He's saying you can keep going down that wide way. You can go from Pleasant Valley and you can go down to that camp, Ernst. You know what that's going to be? That's wide. But he said, you can keep going that way if you want to, but there's a little narrow road over here. It's only got two lanes. And from here to the hill, it's a straight shot. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. There's a narrow way, a straight way. Still goes by the cross. You know what Levi was? He was just a roundabout saying, hey, if you want God, he that way. You can keep going that way, but you can't ignore me. I'm a roundabout. You try to blow through me and things are going to go bad for you because God's got my back. But you got to choose to slow down and you got to pay attention. Roundabout Christians, not only can they not be ignored, roundabout Christians require a choice. When you get to a roundabout, you don't just hit the gas and keep going like a red light. You can't keep going the way that you got to choose either to turn left or to turn off and to turn right. So many people caught in indecision, they're just driving around in circles around roundabouts. We got too many Christians just driving in circles saying, All right, Lord, when do I get off? Some of us just need to decide to be, Lord, I'm done driving. Just put me in the middle of one. Let me tell people, that's where you need to get off. That right there, that's where you need to go. You know, when you come to a roundabout, you got to pay attention to the signs. If it's dark, if it's not too light outside, well, what do you think this world is? It's dark right now. We got a little bit of light. What are we doing? We're just shining lights on the road signs. But if you're unfamiliar with the area, you got to pay attention to the signs or else you're going to get turned around real quick. You know what Levi was? He was one that had understanding of where he was and how to get to God. Hey, stranger, I know you're not familiar with this area. That way, that's, just, that's a lot of noise. That's death. That's destruction. That's the dangerous road. That road right there will take you to life. Here's the light. I'm going to shine the light onto the sign for you. You know what it says? Christ, that way. That's the way to life. Levi was out there knowing that people could miss it. What's it say? It says that his life turned many from iniquity. Not all, but many. Levi had an impact on those around him, and God said a priest is a messenger from God. Go read the book of Revelation. You know what you are? You're a king and a priest. You get the benefit of being able to enter into the throne room of God and offer up your own prayers to God directly, but you also have the responsibility of being a mouthpiece for God as a priest you know what we need we need to say Lord put me in the middle of a roundabout let me just tell people which way is the right way it says that they knew that Levi had so much sense that they sought answers from his mouth they came to him and asked him for the truth why because they believed that he knew it you get people to slow down just long enough to see how much of a touch God will put on your life, there's a lot of people that will be turning away from iniquity. Not because of you, but because of the one whose words are in your mouth. The one whose love pours off of your lips. The one that puts you in the middle of the roundabout. First John chapter 5. Uh, let me read verse 1, 2, and 3 to you. 
Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. When we were in uh, St. Lucia, in one of the sessions that I was teaching, I made, I made a statement about my life before I was saved. I said three basic things. I hated school, I hated reading, and I hated to study. Amen. That's not good for school, but that was me. And when the session was over with, Brother Lou Godonio, who pastors in Hamburg, New York, in the Buffalo area, he asked a question. He said, do you still hate those things? Because he knows that mostly what I do now as a born-again believer requires that I'm not ever out of school, that I have to study constantly, and I have to read all the time. So we asked the question, do you still hate those things? Are you doing them simply because you know you're supposed to as a child of God, or is something different? Now the answer to that is, something's different. You see, those things that were once grievous to me are not grievous now. Now, why is that the case? Because when you get saved, God changes you. The Bible says that you are a new creature in Christ Jesus. His commandments are not grievous because it's different now since Jesus saved my soul. It's different now. He put a new song in my mouth. Uh, he made a new creature out of me. Uh, he put a new desire in my heart that I did not have before. The only thing I wanted to do, basically, before I got saved was play drums. That's all I wanted to do. That's what I lived. That's what I slept. That's what I drank. Everything was about drums to me. My teachers at school, they, I drive them crazy. I sat in my least favorite class of them all, algebra. And I was sitting in that class, I saw heads go up and down just like this. Okay. I swear I'm glad I didn't learn it because I haven't used it. Y'all get that in a minute. All right. But I would sit in class. I would do that on the desk all the time. And the teacher would say, just go to the band room and get out of here. She knew that that's all that was on my mind. Algebra was not it. But once I got saved, all of a sudden, a book opened up and said, read me. Study me. Stay in school. I'm not talking about a building somewhere. I'm talking about in the school of learning what this book says. Study to show thyself. Stay in school and get this. He put a new desire in my heart. He gave me a new path to travel and a new purpose for life. He equipped me with what I needed so I could do what he wanted me to do. Even though before I hated that. But now, it's not grievous. My greatest joy before I was saved was to have somebody come and listen to me play and, and see on their face somehow or another that they really enjoyed what I did. I thought that was, it couldn't get any higher than that. And, and a night where I was, as we used to say, I was just on. I was in a groove that night. I was playing really well. And it was just one of those nights. That was a, that was a highlight of my life. And then I got saved. And now, other than leading somebody to the Lord, the highlight of my life is to proclaim what He's let me read, what He's let me study, and see what I call the light bulb go off over somebody's head. That they get it. That God gave it to me and you give it and they got it. 
It, it, it just doesn't get any better than that to me. Uh, this past week was a highlight for me. An absolute highlight. The very things that I once hated are now those things that delight my soul. Studying the Word of God is a joy. Uh, uh, seeing it unfold before you is an amazing thing. Amazing thing. Knowing that God has personally, now get this, has personally been in your presence to show you the truth is absolutely beyond being able to describe. Are the things of God grievous to you? Do you have to do? Or do you want to do? Has your direction changed? Is your path different? I don't know how you get saved and stay the same. I don't believe you do. Uh, how, can you, how can you make the commandments of the Lord to not be grievous in your life? Three really quick things. You love the Lord. You care about the souls of men. And you rejoice in the fact that you have a privilege to serve God. An absolute privilege. Realize it's a privilege to be a child of the King. It's a privilege to serve the Lord. And it's a privilege to do something that has some eternal value to it. If I had the ability, which I do not, to just flip a quarter in the air and catch a 50 cent piece, you know the kind of people I'm talking about that could just make money and make money and make money. Not one dollar of that money will ever enter heaven. Now, maybe what you do with it can, but that money's not going there. But think of what you can do that can have that eternal value that makes a difference in people's lives. How could it be grievous to be allowed to be involved in the spiritual things of eternity. If we realize what God's allowing us to do, the idea of saying no would never cross our mind. Never cross our mind. Do you know Him as your Savior tonight? Are you serving Him as your Lord? Are you making a difference? Is keeping His commandments grievous? Or do you realize it's a privilege? God lets us serve Him. What a joy that is. In Ezra chapter number 6, we find a hallmark day in Israel. Israel had not listen to the prophets of God. They'd ignored them. They'd stoned them. They'd mistreated them. The prophets that were sent of God told them, either you repent or God's going to destroy Israel. And they mocked the messengers and ignored it. They did not repent and God did destroy Israel and she was taken captive, led off to Babylon and then led to Persia. Can I say that Israel, everything that she boasted in was destroyed. They still estimate that Solomon's temple was the greatest edifice ever built by man. And it laid in ruins for 70 years. By the time we get to Ezra chapter number 6, God has began to work. He's began to work to bring the people of Israel back to their homeland. They are uh, blessed to find favor in foreign kings to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And now by the time we get to Ezra 6, they have worked to restore the temple. Ezra 6, verse 15, the Bible says, And this house was finished on the third day, the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And the children of Israel, the priests, the Levites, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept the dedication of this house of God with joy and offered at the dedication of this house of God a hundred bullocks, two hundred rams, uh, four hundred lambs, uh, and for a, a sin offering for all Israel, twelve he goats according uh, to the number of the tribes of Israel. And they set the priest in order 
or I'm sorry, and they set the priests in their divisions and the Levites in their courses for the service of God, which is at Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. In these verses, I want you to notice, first of all, the temple is now done. Verse 15, and the house was finished. It was done. It was completed. Notice that they dedicated it in verse 16. It said, and they kept the dedication of the house of God. Notice in verse 19, they deployed, they put to use uh, the priests in their divisions, the Levites in their courses for the service of the house of God. This is what I want to give you a little thought tonight. I want to give you a thought on just stick with it. Just stick with it. Just stick with the thought of having a touch of God. Just stick with the thought of getting close to God and having a winning attitude. Just stick with the thought that people are dying and going to hell and you need to warn them. Just stick with the fact that the things of God are not grievous, but a joy and a pleasure. And just stick with them. Just stick with pointing folks in the roundabout to the right direction. Uh, just stick with it, my dear friends. Uh, 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 listen, uh, I know you can become weary and well-doing, but this thing's about over. Keep running your race with patience. Uh, just stick with it. Uh, the Christian life in the sprint, it's a marathon. Uh, just keep sticking with it. Uh, God will keep putting wind in your sails. Uh, just stick with it. Notice, first of all, their persistence. Look again in verse 15. And the house of God was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, uh, which was in the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. Can I say it took them 17 years to complete it? 17 years. When you read the Bible, you say they got the, the temple finished. Great, wonderful. 17 years. Uh, can I say? Um, that's generational. Just stick with it. God, a day with him is a thousand years, a thousand years a day. God's not interested in our timetable. Just stick with it. Just be persistent. Just always uh, be steadfast, unmovable, abounding in the work of God. One of the ju true joys of our church, uh, folks that came to 20 years ago and preached, they come back and they still see many of you that was here 20 years ago. Uh, we got a little bit of gray in our hair, a uh, little more wrinkles on our forehead, uh, but we're still sticking with it. Uh, just be persistent. Uh, there may be some, uh, Brother Phil, that have left, uh, 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 that have went uh, because of a famine, uh, to another land. Uh, but hey, uh, if they ever come back, uh, what a blessing when they say, look, they're still here. Uh, they're still earnestly contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Uh, they're still sticking with it. Uh, I don't care what the modern churches are. Uh, hey, I want to be what the church has always been. Uh, faithful and true. Just stick with it. Uh, they were persistent. Uh, can I say this? Notice, if you will, their pleasure. Look, if you will, in verse number 16. And the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, uh, and the rest of the children of the captivity kept with dedication of this house of God with joy. It was pleasurable. They'd worked 17 years, and now they're going to dedicate it, and they had a time. Hmm? Huh? Can I say, when we come to the house of God, we ought to have time. It ought to not be grievous. It ought to be a joy. You know, we all deserve to be in hell. Uh, but I'm not going to hell. It's what I deserve, but I'm not going there. Uh, and hey, I get to come to the house of God. Uh, I get to hear young people sing about the blood. Uh, I get to hear folks get up and proclaim the word. Uh, I get to hear folks testify the goodness of God. Uh, hey, that's a joy. Uh, hey, uh, you listen to what this world has to say. That's grievous. Uh, but the things of God ought to bring a joy to our soul. It was pleasurable. We see their persistence. We see their pleasure. Notice they're presenting. Verse number 17 says, They offered at the dedication of his house of God a hundred bullocks, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs, and a sin offering for all Israel, twelve he goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. Hmm? Now we just read that verse. That didn't seem like much, did it? Didn't seem like that cost much. And what Brother Ron said to have a touch of God, it's going to cost you something. Boy, some of you bucked up. You thought, oh boy, it's offering time. 
Can I say, we usually give out of our abundance. When you read that verse there, they gave out a sacrifice. Do you realize every one of those offerings, they had to slay the animal and drain it of its blood. And then they had to part it in certain parts and then burn it to God. Now let me just give you a little bit of how much it cost them. Now the Bible said that they gave a hundred bullocks. They had to part that thing into four pieces. That means 400 times they went to the altar. And then it says that they gave uh, uh, not only 100 bullocks, 200 rams. They had to part them four times. That's 800 trips to the altar. Hmm? And then it said that uh, 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 they had to give a sin offering for all of Israel. Or no, it said 400 lambs. Uh, that's 1,600 trips. And 12 uh, he goats. Uh, that's 48 trips. In other words, they went to the altar 2,848 times to present to the Lord their sacrifice. Say, so, preacher, I've been praying for years. I've been going to the altar for years praying for my loved ones. Don't quit. Keep that offering fresh before the Lord. Hmm? Preacher, I've been praying for this for years. That woman with the issue of blood had it 12 years and spent all that she had going to many physicians, but she still made her way to Jesus. Just keep sticking with it. Uh, God's not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Our labor in the Lord's never in vain, friend. Just stick with it. You may lose count, but God doesn't. Mm. Say, why is God taking so long? God's just working it just right. Hmm? Amen, Listen, how many of you know that I love going to Montgomery Inn and eating some ribs? Amen. How many has ever been to Montgomery Inn and ate some ribs? Hmm? Isn't it a blessing? You give the person the order, they always come and say, they tell you all the specials. We got this, 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 I don't care. I want, I want some ribs. <laughs> so she goes away, she brings me a salad. She brings me some bread. I say she, sometimes it's a he. huh? And in about 15, 20 minutes, Brother Clint, here they come. Boom. Uh, now they'll ask you if you want a bib. I've seen some of you eat, get a bib. I never get a bib because I'm not going to miss a drop. Uh, and I eat them ribs. I eat so much of them ribs. I just keep eating them ribs. That by the time I get home, them ribs get bigger after you eat them. I can't breathe for a while. But I enjoy them ribs. The whole ordeal from the time you walk in and be seated until the time you're getting ready to leave is usually about an hour. But see, you never see what it took for you to have them ribs. Somebody went to the slaughterhouses in Chicago and hand-picked what ribs they wanted. Then they were transported here to Cincinnati. And then they were put up. And then when it came time mm, for them to be served, long before the restaurant ever opened, somebody got there and they boiled them ribs for about four hours. Then they basted them for another hour or so. And then you order them, and then they come to your table fresh and hot. You see, somebody had to prepare them. Somebody had to be there and cook them. Somebody had to go through all the work so I could sit there and burp for about four hours afterwards, huh? Can I say, if I'd get them before they're boiled, they'd be nasty. If I got them after they was boiled, they'd have no flavor. You see... God never does anything nasty or never does anything too soon. He always is right on time and He does all things well. Just stick with it. Keep presenting your petitions before the Lord and just wait. One day, one day, your number come up. Hmm? Can I say this? Just stick with it. Let me say lastly, notice the placement. Look at verse number 18. And they set the priests in their divisions, 
and the Levites in their courses for the service of God which was at Jerusalem as it is written in the book of, of Moses. And the children of the captivity kept the Passover upon the 14th day of the first month for the priests and the Levites were purified together and all of them were pure and killed the Passover for all the children of captivity and for their brethren the priests and for themselves. Notice they all served in their place. It is a grievous thing to God when we try to be what we're not. And it's a grievous thing to God when we get out of our place. Friends, we're fitly framed together in the family of God. There's only one Dr. Phil. Don't try and be Dr. Phil. Just be you. But be in your place. When you're in your place, serving to the capacity you're supposed to serve, everybody else will be blessed. When we get out of place, it becomes a hindrance. I'll say this, I've said this before. If you're not pulling your weight, that's causing other people to pull their weight and yours too. When there's more than one person not pulling their weight, it's more pressure on people, more pressure. The reason a lot of churches aren't going forward is they're being pulled backwards. Because you can only bear so much. Be in your place. Pull your weight. Just stick with it and watch and see what God does. Hmm? God help us to just stick with it. Hmm? There's a lot of things you can't do. There's a lot of things I can't do. But we can't do those things God has commanded us to do and God has equipped us to do. Just stick with it. Just be what he'd have you to be. And friend, when he appears... You'll not be ashamed to see. God help us tonight to adhere to all the preaching we've heard. Let's all stand. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation. Maybe God spoke to you about something. Maybe God spoke to you about somebody dying and going to hell. You got a burden for them. Maybe God spoke to you about having a winning attitude. Maybe God spoke to you about uh, something else that some of these men have preached on, having a touch or maybe uh, being more committed to the things of God and not letting them be grievous because they're not grievous. I don't know. Maybe God spoke to you tonight. If he spoke to your heart, the altar's open. Some are already come. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for all the messages. God, we heard more preaching tonight than some nations will ever hear. God, you have blessed us and gifted our church. And God, I thank you for it. And Lord, not only for the preachers, but for those that play instruments, for those that have the talent to sing, for those who teach classes, for those that are willing to mow the lawn and work the flowers and clean the restrooms and God, those that sweep the floors and those that do things that nobody else even knows about, but they're just in their place. God, you have blessed us and every time we congregate, your presence is a gift for those being in their place. Now, Father, I pray after all this good preaching, God, folks, would just mind the Lord now in this invitation. But I pray especially for somebody here not saved that tonight would be the night of their salvation. Speak to hearts, get glory to your name, and Father, we'll bless you for what you do, for it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Turn Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.